Hi, my name's Melvin, and the dress was blue and black. Welcome to Cinematic Doctrine, a non-spoiler Christian movie podcast where we sit at the table of cinema and eat. Tonight we'll be dining on Dexter Fletcher's Rocket Man. Coming comfortably off the heels of the ridiculously popular Bohemian Rhapsody, I won't be the first to say there are a lot of similarities between that movie and this one. But where they differ is what truly makes Rocket Man shine. In fact, it's an interesting phenomenon to see both films responded to differently, despite their similarities. I think that comes down to the difference in vision, where Bohemian Rhapsody attempted to be a biopic, Rocket Man chose to be a fantastic musical. And while Rocket Man doesn't look to be closing in on Bohemian Rhapsody's maddening 900 million box office run, I think anyone worth their money would admit to Rocket Man being the better film. But I digress, I've barely started my review and I couldn't last 30 seconds before comparing similar films. Heck, they even shared the same director, what with Brian Singer getting fired from Bohemian Rhapsody and Dexter Fletcher having to come on set to finish the film. Funny how things work out like that. Anyway, let's get into Rocket Man. From IMDb, Rocket Man is a musical fantasy about the fantastical human story of Elton John's breakthrough years. Rocket Man is rated R for language throughout, some drug use, and sexual content. Fairly consistent cursing, as the certificate says, the drug use is also consistent from the third act onward. Now, the sexual content is the toughest here. Perhaps the most overt is intense kissing between two men, which happens in each act of the film. A sequence in which two men sleep together and you see the backside of one of them. A scene between a man and a woman in a car that is conveniently obstructed, and another moment between two men that is brief, fully clothed, but the implication is a little shocking. There's also one dance number in which it's implied that the actions taking place are a collective act of debauchery. However, this sequence has everyone clothed and is in the dark. The most offensive here would probably be the implication paired with the dancing, as it's a musical number. However, the sequence is ultimately painted what is taking place as part of Elton's addiction. In other words, it's shot with the intention of condemning the action, although the other scenes I can't say the same. So to get started, have you ever listened to your song by Elton John? I'm sure you have. I mean, goodness, who hasn't? A romantic, intimate, innocent song about the somewhat confused yet very real feelings of love. Despite its namesake, Rocket Man, I feel, is propelled by your song, not Rocket Man. At its core, it is fulfilled by the satisfying romance and poetry of your song, or at the very least, the grand question of where can I find this love that one might have when hearing its lyrics. From the very beginning, we start with the end result of searching in all the wrong places. Taryn Egerton, who does a fantastic job performing as Elton John, sits in a rehab center all dolled up in one of his stage costumes and begins his testimony. I'm an alcoholic, a cocaine addict sex addict, prescription addict, and so on. We're then transported to his childhood where we're immediately greeted with our first dance number, which, by the way, made me the happiest man on earth. I just love a good musical. But joy aside, it's a fascinating way to start the film. Almost seems counterintuitive to start out incredibly depressing and immediately go into a fun neighborhood-wide dance sequence. But something about it simply works, and this dichotomy is balanced with precision throughout the rest of the film. But more importantly, it emphasizes that Elton's emotional problems start early on. This search for love isn't something that starts in teenage developmental years. It happens the moment you can look to your father and ask, when will you hug me? And on Elton's relationship with his parents as presented in the film, Bryce Dallas Howard, who plays Elton's mom, had her reservations about playing her character. In fact, she didn't want to accept the role initially as she wasn't comfortable vilifying a mother. Worried, she contacted people who knew his mother and learned that Elton's treatment growing up was worse than the film presents. And having fulfilled the role, she too puts on a fine performance that at times is quite chilling. And honestly, throughout the entire story, there are repeatedly manipulative, nasty, hateful, uncaring, all-around unloving people from start to finish. Yet the story seeks to sympathize with that struggle, the idea of utter and complete ostracization, the constant gamble for happiness. The incessant nagging of self-deprecation, the fear of never being loved. It isn't a film that is ignorant to how difficult these struggles are. It's honestly why I found myself so emotional over and over and 
over with this film. It's the sort of story that is so in tune with the human condition, you can't help but find yourself in Elton John's story. And in a world such as ours, where Adam's rejection of God, the very same God who identifies as love itself, no wonder that we would have a by-birth fundamental problem with love, be it our own inability to love others or our constant search for things to fill the loveless vacancy in our hearts. To bear witness to that struggle in such a masterful, patient story like Rocket Man can't help but synergize with you, tugging on your heartstrings and putting you in a position where you go, Oh, I feel that so deeply. I hurt with you. There's a scene where Elton is at a party after a concert and he's really clinging to songwriter and friend Bertie Taupin, played by Jamie Bell, and when Bernie goes off to be with a woman, Elton is left alone. We're treated to a masterful use of Tiny Dancer for the next musical number, and there's such an incredible loneliness to this scene. And I must tell you, there's nothing lonelier than feeling alone at a party. It's a reminder of how lonely you are, watching everybody talk, have fun, laugh, weep, hold each other, and you're off on the margin looking at the communion among other people. It's really just horrible. I must confess, I often prefer to host parties because even if I'm feeling lonely, I can find something I can do for others or go out of my way to grab drinks or food for my friends. But very often when my wife and I are invited to a gathering, I find myself feeling that same way, that yearning for attention, yearning for compassion and companionship. I feel like I'm sort of on the outside just looking in even though I'm at this party. And it sounds selfish to beg for attention, but in our rejection of God, we severed the single greatest relationship we could have ever had. A relationship where God eagerly overflows our hearts with compassion and care, and now we're at a party trying to find replacements, perusing options to fill this void, or maybe we've given up, deciding it would be better to wait it out, only to find that the party is going to end, and we'll end up alone the entire evening. Now, of course, I'm not heading home alone. I have a wonderful wife I can talk to and share my woes with. In fact, I did that just recently after a gathering we attended, and that's wonderful. Love is wonderful. Joy, compassion, honesty, commitment, all of it worthwhile because of our relationship to God first and foremost. But Rocket Man isn't about a man who experiences that kind of love. It isn't a story about the kind of love experienced from a god who condescended himself to become a man, live a perfect life, die for his people, overcome sin, and raise again. The answer for love lost in Rocket Man is as modern and western as you'd expect. It's a story of self-acceptance, a story of self-recognition, a story of facing your battles. I'm not here to denounce those as bad things. If you saw my weeping, tear-strung face during the climax of the film, you'd know that I was greatly moved by the way it ended and felt a sense of ownership to that experience. There are things I struggle with to this day that demand I revisit them with confidence, own up to them, and accept them as they are. But there's a key difference between what the film proposes as the solution to finding love and the way we find love in scripture. Jesus Christ's love for me is where I must go first, because if it wasn't for God showing his love for me, there's honestly no reason to think I'm a lovable person. In my Mandy episode, I expressed my anger at injustice, the rage that festers in my heart toward those who are nasty, hateful, evil people. Yet, it would be a lie from the darkest place of my heart if I didn't accept that I too am one of those people. I have rejected those in the margins, sometimes skirted the chance to make conversation with others I have deemed unworthy of my time. I have said hateful, hateful things to those I love amidst my anger. I have schemed sinful acts at the expense of those I love. I have hidden in the darkness and let weeds grow among my heart, tending it like a garden. But while I was still a sinner, God sent his son to die for me on the cross because he loved me. And I have to trust that his love is true before I can even begin loving myself. Because sin isn't something that simply happens within your heart, but impacts the lives of those around us with every action. Like a soft wind in the Bahamas that creates a typhoon in the Florida coast, there are catastrophic consequences for even the smallest of sins. How could I ever repay that? Glory be to God for his wondrous love. But I must confess, it should not and cannot stop there. Our love cannot stop within ourselves. It must overflow. In fact, we know it does. As God pours his love like a streaming river, lapping at the edges of our small hearts, spilling onto the very earth we stand, 
Therefore, we need to be conscious of where that love goes. Now, although this part of Elton John's life wasn't in the film, in real life, he was good friends with a boy in Indiana who had been diagnosed with AIDS after a blood transfusion. Ryan White was 13 at the time and was near immediately discriminated against by his peers. His questions of his sexuality arose and even slurs were covering his locker. And worst of all, church members rejected them, abandoning them in their time of need to a special designated pew in the sanctuary. Elton was moved by this injustice, so he reached out to them. He had lunch with them and learned that Ryan's mother, Elaine White Ginder, was fighting to have Ryan return to school despite them kicking him out. Elton stood by the family, raised support and awareness for them, even helped with house payments to alleviate stress. Ryan White grew to be a real poster child for HIV-AIDS discrimination, and the Western world was taken by storm as his plight was made public. All of this is very active, very real, very tangible acts of self-sacrifice, as Elton didn't have to do any of this. But by forsaking himself, his time, his money, he was able to help out this struggling family in many different ways. Ways in which the church quite honestly should have already been doing. And as awareness rose, Ryan returned to school and even landed a job at a skateboard shop. His mother remembers lamenting at first about the wage he was getting, saying, they're not even paying you enough for the gas prices, to which Ryan responded, you don't get it, Mom. I, I get to work like everybody else. I have a job. And Elton was by their side, even to Ryan's death, performing Skyline Pigeon at his funeral in 1990. The impact of this relationship had profound effects on Elton himself, going so far as to claim his relationship with their family the single most important factor in fighting against his addictions. And... I don't know, I've, I just find myself thinking a lot about this. Reginald Dwight, now Elton John, neglected and rejected by his parents with such ferocity that for 16 years of his life he torments himself with heinous drugs, sexual indulgences, and feeding off the attention of the world to drown out the sorrows of his life, then uses his riches to help a young boy fight for his right to be respected by his peers. Ryan White experiences horrible, evil discrimination by the world for his medical condition, one that put him at risk of death at every turn, goes on to impact the world as a testament for HIV-AIDS awareness, a hero amongst his community, and even inspired the Ryan White Comprehensive AIDS Resource Emergency Act, which passed after his death. And not only that, greatly affected and changed the life of a man whose albums constituted 5% of the world's total purchases. And then... We as Christians, horrible, evil sinners who once rejected God, now invited into his kingdom by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, are now tasked with the great commission to make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them of the unceasing, overflowing love he has for us, to impact the world just as God told Abraham he would be a blessing among the nations, to be a people of spreading the love we've been given, pouring it out across the needy, weak, poor, damaged, hurting, marginalized, discriminated, targeted, hated, abused, lonely, isolated, and misguided of the world. All of this not as pop stars or heroes, but as broken artists and deeply sick people, as sons and daughters of God the Father through Jesus Christ, making people recognize how wonderful it is that they're in the world. Thanks so much for checking out this episode of Cinemac Doctrine. If you saw Rocket Man, what did you think of it? Did you love the way it fits Elton John's own songs into telling his story, or did you find the film too unrealistic in the way it portrayed his life? Because boy, it gets pretty magical at times. Let me know at Cinemac Doctrine's website or shoot me an email, all of which will be available in the show notes. Next week, I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> It's the first weekend where I've, or week, where I've just decided, uh, you know what, I'm not going to schedule anything. But I will have an episode, I just don't know what it's going to be. So, until then, stay cool. <laughs> <laughs>